Hi, my name is Lyle Sopel, and I'm a jade and gemstone sculptor, and you're here with me in my studio today. And uh, we're going to talk about a few things that have to do with uh, selling your art and getting over the struggles of um, believing you have to work hard to make money and that sort of thing. So, uh, first of all, I just wanted to share some, you know, really kind of fun and exciting things that we've been working on over this last month. It's just been a really busy month. We've, uh, you know, we've been in California earlier this month and in Palm Springs as well. And um, then we came back and we did a, uh, a film with um, WeChat people. And uh, it's, uh, it's Omar is the name of the production company that's produced this film. And you might have already seen it on Facebook. Uh, we have it posted on uh, Lyle Sopel, the, the site, so you might just check it there or look at look under Omar for it. But uh, it's pretty exciting. It's a really great uh, new film. It's called the uh, Soul Sculptor. So we did that all here in the studio, and if you look at it, you might uh, see some of the scenes that you already see when you visit me here on uh, Ask Lyle. So uh, that's pretty good. It's um, I think it's already got about almost 8,000 views already and it's just been out a couple of days so it's looking to be a pretty uh, interesting uh, film for us. So along with that we did uh, on Sunday just last week was um, a BCJ Day and um, BCJ Day has like been commemorated that the 28th of May has been commemorated as the day that British Columbia celebrates jade as our provincial stone and so there's always some big celebration around it and government officials and so we all attended it and uh, people that are in the biz showed some of their work and I took my sculptures so it was kind of fun and it's really interesting to do that. Um, I want to show you some of the new projects that I've been working on and I'm really excited because it's the end of the month or the beginning of a new month and so I'm just finishing all my projects that I had worked on through the month of uh, May and this is one of them that uh, we just showed you at the opening scene here. Really beautiful little ruby cardinal. And um, I want to publicly thank Louis Alberto for this ruby because uh, this stuff is really beautiful. I really, I can't say I love working it yet because I just started working on it. I've done a couple of pieces now and uh, I'm, I was really challenged to to polish it and you can see that I did manage and uh, it came out quite well. But it was a bit of a struggle, not that artists need to struggle, but I did a little bit with this one and uh, the end result was pretty satisfying. So I've used um, like an alligator quartz where it's got a bunch of different holes in it, it makes it a very interesting um, base mounting and then I've used the jade for the reeds and I've mounted the cardinal in a way that uh, makes him look like he's kind of blowing in the, in the wind. So one of the things that I had a challenge with, with uh, the finishing the surface, because ruby is, is, a, is a crystal and crystal has a certain structure that for me, I had to get used to it. It's, it's just kind of understanding and feeling how the stone went. So, um, I had a really hard time just getting that surface smooth enough so that I could get a polish. And I remembered something that Ryan Spangler put on uh, his uh, Facebook page. And it was this little tool. And I want to thank you, Ryan, because this was awesome. It really did a great job for me. And what it is, is I just used a regular bit that I would normally use which was a diamond bit, and then I glued a little bit of an eraser to the end of it, and then on the end I have some diamond paper. It's a uh, metal, metal um, pelleted diamond, and I just glued that, cut it and glued it on the end of this eraser. Now it's just awesome. I went up to 1000 grit, and I got the surface cleaned up very, very finely and uh, that allowed me to take it to uh, a polish. And so I'm going to show you some of my, my, my polish process a little bit later, but um, this tool is awesome. If you guys have, any, have a chance to use it, uh, Ryan Spangler's idea, 
really wonderful. Helped really a lot to get into all these little tight spots. Cleaned up those inside lines, made it smooth. Took the kind of the fuzziness off the, the ruby. And over here, we got another really beautiful piece of mine. Just, there's so much abundance in my studio this month with all these beautiful pieces. I just uh, can't get over it. I really just love working with sculpture. This is a Canada goose that you saw last week in various pieces. And so here we have a secondary one that's not quite assembled, but these two will work together. And as you can see, we've got the feet. And this is how I assemble pieces and drill holes. And then this will be glued together. And so that will come on like that. So this is a green jade, green nephrite from British Columbia, black Australian jade, and then the, the inset here is a uh, jadeite from uh, Burma. So I've got a beautiful quartz with a little bit of green in it, and then some pins you can see, which will uh, support the, the um, Canada goose. And he's going to be flying like that way. He'll sit there just for this moment, but it's kind of how he's going to be. And then the, the second one will be in a, another position behind him, up in this direction. I don't know if I can show you that just yet. But this piece will be finished today. So we're just doing the final cleanup on it and the final part of the polish. So we'll put all the feet and the and uh, the tail parts together and then assemble it on the base. So, wonderful. Canada geese are my favorite piece, my favorite birds. So, that's really, really cool. And um, I have another piece over here that we've been working on. And um, he's just at the carving stage where the, the pattern has been just carved into them, and uh, I'm going to demonstrate this piece in a, in a few minutes on how I bring up um, a polish onto this textured surface. So that's a technique I've developed, and it might not be the way everybody does it, but it's something that works for me, especially in jade. So um, we'll take a look at that. So last week um, I introduced this. Uh, 10 Insider Secrets to Breaking Free from the Starving Artist Myth. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a really great reminder to, to pick up on this because I've got 10 myths in here that talk about, you know, uh, should artists struggle in order to be authentic? You know, that kind of is like one of the very first and most important kind of myths that... Um, we are you know, subject to as artists, like we, we have this belief that um, that's either induced to us or we live this belief because of social conditions we are in that we have to suffer in order to be authentic. So we, we address those points and I think it's really important as an artist to know what's affecting our minds because in order to be creative we have to have a clear mind and we have to approach our subjects in a way that, um, you know, are really authentic to us. They come from our heart. And if we've got outside influences like, you know, society or, you know, uh, peer beliefs that, you know, you can't make it and if you're making it, then you're not real and that kind of stuff. So I think it's really important to get this book, be familiar at least with the 10 kind of most important ones that we think are, you know, more relevant to us, and then um, read it again and again, and keep familiarizing yourself with it so you know that it's not, it's not true. The truth is something else. The truth is not what we've been taught, you know. The truth is what you really feel and believe in yourself, how you believe in yourself. So, um, you know, it's, it's the way to be successful, is to be conscious about how you approach your art. So that's why I put this book together, to just keep it all familiar. So it's good for me, I love to have it around too, and, and it's very beautiful. It's really a work of art. So um, you can get this book, and all you have to, you can get it for free actually, I'm going to give it away to all 
my Facebook fans. And so you can go to Global Arts Vision forward slash Ask Lyle, and you can get a free download of this. So it's only free to the people that are here watching uh, this live Facebook. So that's for you. It's my gift. So I want to go on now to um, this idea that we talked about, like on the wall, like like, like a creative idea on how to um, how to build a, a constructive business approach to your art. Now, um, that promotes the question of what do, what do uh, successful artists do that not so successful artists don't do? So you think about it, like, ooh, who's successful in the world today? You know, like there's, there's people out there that, that some artists make tremendous amount of money, you know, like... Uh, like um, Jeff Coombs, for instance, uh, American artist who did, um, you know, the metal balloon dog, you know, Poodle. He sold that thing for like, what, $16 million? You know, um, Daniel Hurst made that diamonds studded human skull. It was reputed to be selling for, like, it sold for $100 million. So there's, there's, People out there that can make money, but I, I had a, a really interesting um, thing come up the other day. I was doing some research, and I found that there was some research done on Michelangelo. And uh, a writer wanted to research Michelangelo and find out, you know, when a certain part of the Sistine Chapel was done, and you know what what year, and you know it was was it cataloged in Florence and that sort of thing. And so he came he went into the the archives in Florence to discover that he couldn't find out dates and times of the actual production of the Sistine Chapel, but what he did come across was Michelangelo's bank account. Yeah, his bank account. Like, I always thought that Michelangelo was somehow, you know, uh, commercialized with the church or he was, you know, um, imprisoned in some way by the church to produce art for them. You know what? Michelangelo was an incredibly wealthy Renaissance artist. According to these records that are, are true Florentine uh, records of his bank accounts, get this, at equivalent dollar value, Michelangelo had $45 million in his bank account. That's equ equivalent to today's values. So he was like one of the most successful Renaissance artists in the world. And he set a precedent, really, that, that others, like even us today, can, can work towards. So, you know, even back then, artists were not starving. You know, starving as an artist is, is kind of like some kind of, it's a myth, <laughs> for one thing for sure. It's a myth that we've been led to believe that you have to do in order to be authentic. Well, the fact is that to be authentic, you have to come from your heart. You have to create from a place that you feel good about it. And then you have to also be able to live by what you do. And so, you know, art and commerce are not separate. There's, there are not two different things. It's a thing that you have to unite in some way and like, if you want to continue to create, you have to have a means by which you can continue. So what do successful artists do? Well, they probably do things like, you know, show their work as much as they can show their work. And I think like in today's world, you can use uh, the multimedia um, in so many ways, like, um, you know, Facebook and Instagram and those kinds of things. A really great thing to do is to just kind of Put your own piece out there, your own new work, on Instagram or Facebook on a regular basis. So people start to notice who you are and see that, oh, there's something new every time. And another way is to really talk about what you do. In a way, like what I'm doing today, like in my studio, I like to show what, what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, that kind of thing. So to do that is a great way to get people's attention. So... A 
Another way is to find a, um, a group that um, you consider to be your people. You know, people that you can relate to and do the kind of art you do, or maybe even a community organization where you can participate in some way. Join your group, associate with those kinds of people in some way so that um, you know, you can uh, learn from other people. And when you're there, you ask questions, um, you um, show your work there to other people, be open, be open to other possibilities. And through all of that, you can get contacts. And through contacts, you can develop more clients. So well, that's just some of it. And so what I wanted to show you what, is what we're doing as a, a studio project right now. And this bear project that I pointed out to you in a, a couple of weeks now is our, our concept and our idea of how to promote a particular group of pieces to our audience. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the idea. Now, we've got a few things listed here. The idea, the list, the, the product that you love or produce, the art that you produce. Uh, and then you share with your list of people, uh, follow up on your clients, and then that, that, that turns into money, which you put in your bank account. Now, that's how we've laid out the project. But the first thing is the idea. Now, um, I chose bears because I really like the subject. That's something I can really resonate with. And, um, you know, it's an authentic thing for me to want to do this. It's just something, I'm not like contriving this in order to produce the project. I want to, I want to do this because um, I love the animal. I'm really familiar with it, but I don't, I'm not deep enough with it, you know, and I, and I, um, I think that by um, going into a project like this, I can get deeper with the idea. And I think that's what um, is really appealing to a collector or, or, uh, or it's appealing to me as, as the artist. I can get into something. It's like, um, it, it's so important to go beyond what you're feeling comfortable with. And so like to go beyond uh, where I am with this piece and into um, a place where I hadn't been before, like sharing this whole process and sharing this idea the way I'm doing it is, um, know a great way to get more attention towards it and it's kind of like a little scary for me because everything's so public but I think that's when it's the right thing is when you're you know beyond your own comfort zone just kind of working in the studio and taking it up to another level where it can be more public and more aware and and, and get more people's attention that way so <clears throat> you know the, the the thought was I've always studied bears, and I've created quite a few of them, but I've always got the information about bears from other outside sources, like from, um, you know, photos or videos, or, you know, whenever I'd see a bear, it would be from a distance. It wasn't, like, up close. So at some point, I took a crew, uh, not a cruise, but we went on, my Curtis, my son, and I went on expedition to Knight's Inlet, and we got really close to these bears and I was able to get like within you know 10 or 20 feet of these guys and I could really really see how they lived in nature and what they ate and how they reacted in their environment and that sort of thing so that that was kind of like the idea and I said wow if I can just share that sense of how I felt with the bears then that would be you know really something you know, that could be a great storyline. It's a great way to, you know, do a series of pieces. I just, not one is not enough. I can do more. So I put a series of things together. So that's what we're doing. That's, that's where the idea comes from. And so um, I would like to just encourage you, you want to follow this path, is to just think, what's, what's, um, what's great for you? What do you feel strongly about? And how do you, how do you uh, want to express it? And then think of it not as just one piece. Think of it as, you know, uh, a series, a group of things, you know, another group of, of, of pieces that you can, you know, um, uh, 
expand on. And when you expand on it, then you've got something more to bring forward to the collector. Okay, so um, we had some postings up. So we'll go over next week, we'll talk about how to build the list, but that's the idea. So authenticity is really the key point. You know, if you're authentic with what you're talking about or you're, you're creating, then you're not selling out. It's got nothing to do with um, selling out, but it is a business approach that you can follow through in a sequential manner. So, you know, I'm going to bring in um, my marketing expert, Lee, and we're going to have an interview with him at some point in the next couple of weeks. And he'll uh, talk to you about how to market this idea, how to get it on, on the Internet, how to maybe build a web page for it, and that sort of thing. So um, I'm going to show you what we've done so far. If you want to go to lylesappel.com forward slash bears, that's lylesappel.com forward slash bears, and you'll see our first landing page for this project. And that will really illustrate how the idea has come forward and how we're presenting it. So that's, that's our first step. So enjoy that. And uh, so I want to ask, answer a few questions because I know we're getting on in time here. But I know um, the, uh, the first question we had on uh, talking points today was, you know, what's, what's the, uh, you know, the best way to sell your art and the most effective way to sell your art? Well, what we've been talking about is a really great way to sell your, your art, but uh, that's only one way. That's just one aspect of, of, um, of selling your art. And I, I really believe that the, the best way to stay successful as an artist is to have multiple sources of income. So this is one way. So, um, you know, like I've mentioned before, the social media is a great way, uh, Instagram and, and uh, Facebook and those kinds of things where you get your work out there. Um, the, the idea of um, working with a gallery is another way. If you have a gallery you're comfortable with and you, they give you a nice place to show your art, that always puts your name out there, your work out there. People see who you are. Um, like I said before, you can um, be in, involved in some kind of community project, like volunteer to do things with them. And anything that's involved with art, you get involved and you meet people and you get associated and you get all of these kinds of things are ways to get a multiple source of income. Um, one of the things that I, I really love doing, and this is like old style business, but um, this is before the, even the internet, is I would go into hotels, and some hotels, they probably still do it, is they have showcases, like high-end hotels love art in, in their lobbies and stuff like that. So in the old days, there used to be a way that you could actually show your art or whatever. So you could rent the showcase, and I did this for years, is I'd rent a showcase in a high-end hotel, and I'd put my art in there, and then people would walk through the lobby, and I'd have my telephone number, and so many times, many, many, many times, I would go to the showcase, and I could sell my art directly out of the showcase. People would phone me, and they'd say, I want that thing in that showcase. So that's one way. So all of these things that are out there are all ways that can generate income. Don't depend on one thing and just stay focus on that one thing. Try to develop it into more developed or greater ideas. And, um, you know, one way, the other question we had is like, how do you stay motivated and meeting your production times and so on? Well, this is a great day for that because it's first of the month. And that's what I always like to do is I like to work by the month. I like to uh, work from you know the beginning of the month to the end of the month and so this as you're seeing on the bench here today is like some of the things that we've had finished over through the month of May and there's a few other things that I'm not showing you but this is you know really great way to do it have a lot of things and uh, so it's also um, really rewarding as an artist to be able to um, see all your work in one place and it gives, it gives me a real sense of abundance you know I created all this in one month and it feels great to see it so 
That's what I like. I like to plan my month and then work through the month and then plan to finish it all by the end of the month. So it gives me this time constraint and way to deal with it. So um, how to stay creative and um, move through all of this stuff that happens in your life and how do you keep it? How do you stay motivated and, and, and uh, creative through through your day. Uh, so one of the things that that I really like is to uh, think about what is kind of the scary place. Where is the scary place for me? Uh, what is beyond what I feel good about or comfortable with? Um, where is that place? Like, um, that's what motivates me now is like, um, what can take me beyond what I'm familiar with. So, um, the, the way I can explain this is if you, um, if you're creating the same old thing all the time, you know, the same project, you know, I did that and so it's sold, I'm gonna make another one so that's sold, and that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff is like, okay, that's kind of like selling out. That's not, that's not real. You have to move to the other side where you go, well, what can I make that I've never made before that's really interesting and fun and maybe a little scary because I've never done it before. So you want to go there. That's the kind of feeling you need to have and the idea that you want to share is like, oh, this is interesting and fun and go to that kind of direction. So I think that's what keeps me really motivated and um, feeling uh, excited about what I do. And when you do that and you feel that way yourself, it's translated directly into the pieces that you make. There's no question. That's the way you get success. That's the way people love your work. When you're excited and, and having fun with it, then that's exactly what people see when they look at your art. So it makes it successful. So let me get on because um, I wanted to show you how I'm going to polish this bare surface. And like, as you know, it's very rough and so what I did here was I used a, a diamond tool and I went over the surface and I cut all these lines into it. it just took hours and hours to do that but the effect is to have this real chopped up surface and then I went to a sandblaster and I sandblasted that surface and I use a 400 grit silicon carbide in my sandblaster so that sandblaster does 400 grit on the surface. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sand these or sand the highlights off and I'm going to show that to you right now. I've got two grits on my sander. This is a 400 grit silicon carbide which is pretty good but I'd rather go to um, something a little finer for this so I don't sand off all my grit. And this is a, a diamond, this is a diamond pellet in there. And this is a 600 grit. So I'm pretty comfortable to go from the 400 sandblasting to the 600 diamond grit. Now let me just show you. I'm going to get it wet and do some sanding here. Now, I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but I'm starting to get highlights on all the high spots that are there. That's what I'm looking for. Now, these highlights are gonna really emphasize the, the, the hair pattern on the bear. Let's, let me just go a little bit more. Okay. That's all I'm going to need. That's, that's it. I'm, I'm going to go right to my polisher and I'm going to put a polish on those high spots. Huh? Follow me. Now this is a uh, hard, hard felt 
And this is an eight inch wheel. And I use uh, a diamond paste that I mix up myself. And I put that on here like this. It's a very, very fine paste, very fine diamond. Now just apply it to the surface of the wheel and it gets impregnated in that surface like that. And it soaks in eventually. So um, I'll just dry this off so we can see what I'm doing. So we're pretty close already. You can see that those, those fine lines are cut in there. They're, they're going to be showing up already. Let's do some polishing. See that? Very shiny. So what's shiny is, is, is the high spots and then the interior parts where the cuts are. I will use a, a little um, brush, like a polishing brush, with more compound and it'll get inside there as well and it'll clean it all up. So there you go. The start of the pattern so you can see that it's going to be shiny as well as a little textured in between okay so thanks for being with me today and um, don't forget to look up uh, get your free download on the uh, 10 artist myths and um, the the bear landing page that we were put together It'll give you some great ideas in marketing and uh, hope to see you next week thanks